The focus of this video is neurotransmission. Going from a stimulus to a short distance, relatively weak electrical signal, which is a greater potential, to a long distance, relatively strong electrical signal, which is an action potential. This is how your nervous system conveys information through your body, sending signals from neuron to neuron and neuron to muscle thus allowing for the detection of sensory input and the generation of motor output. Let's start with a neuron at rest and what that looks like. At rest, a neuron will have a resting membrane potential of approximately negative 65 millivolts. The charge inside the neuron is significantly more negative than outside the neuron. This is all through an unequal distribution of positively charged and negatively charged molecules. In other words, there are more positively charged molecules outside the neuron and more negatively charged molecules inside the neuron. At rest, the neuron membrane potential is primarily driven through the combined efforts of sodium-potassium ATPase pumps and potassium leak channels. Sodium-potassium ATPase pumps use energy from breaking ATP phosphate bonds to move three sodium ions out of the neuron into the extracellular fluid while moving two potassium ions into the neuron. This is a prime example of primary active transport in which energy is used to move ions in directions against their electrical chemical gradient. Although there is already a lot of sodium ions outside the neuron, sodium gets pumped there anyways. Although there are already a lot of potassium ions inside the neuron, potassium gets pumped there anyways. This creates an environment in which there are exceptionally strong sodium and potassium electrochemical gradients. Way more sodium outside the neuron, way more potassium ions inside the neuron. An important question with all this is how does the inside of the neuron end up being so negatively charged if there are so many potassium ions which are positively charged? The first answer lies in that for every three positively charged sodium ions pumped out of the neuron, only two positively charged potassium ions are moved back inside the neuron. This results in a net loss of one positive ion per pump. Ultimately, this makes the inside of the neuron more negative. The second answer lies in that inside the neuron, there are significant levels of proteins which are negatively charged. These negatively charged proteins actually outnumber the amount of positively charged potassium ions. Together, the net loss of a positive ion per pump of the sodium-potassium ATPase pumps, plus the high number of negatively charged proteins inside the neuron, results in the resting membrane potential of approximately negative 65 millivolts. While sodium-potassium ATPase pumps drive the creation of the negative 65 millivolt resting membrane potential, potassium leak channels contribute to the maintenance of this membrane potential. Potassium leak channels allow potassium ions to slowly leak out of the neuron, down their electrochemical gradient, back into the extracellular environment from which they were originally pumped in from. By potassium leaking back outside the neuron, Sodium potassium ATPase pumps can pump the potassium back in and bring more sodium outside. In a way, this is sort of like recycling potassium so the sodium electrochemical gradient can be maintained at such a high level. Let's now move our attention to excitation of the neuron and deviating it from the negative 65 millivolt resting membrane potential. In order to first excite a neuron, a stimulus is needed. The stimulus will be either a ligand, which can be a chemical in food or the air, but also a neurotransmitter from another neuron. Or it could be a mechanical force, for example, touch, pressure, or vibration. The stimulus will cause a small deviation from resting membrane potential as ions move into the neuron through specific ion channels. If the ions moving in are positive, then this will lead to depolarization, the inside becoming less negative and the neuron becoming increasingly excited.
the small deviation from resting membrane potential is called a graded potential, which will increase in size as the stimulus size increases. If the graded potential or series of graded potentials are significant enough and the threshold of negative 55 millivolts is reached, then an actual potential is generated by the neuron. An actual potential is the sequence of rapid events that decreases and reverses the neuron membrane potential before restoring it back to the resting state. An action potential consists of two main parts, the rising phase, or depolarization, and the falling phase, or repolarization. The rising phase includes the parts of the action potential where the inside of the neuron becomes neutral in charge, about zero millivolts, and then the overshoot, whereby the inside of the neuron becomes increasingly positive in charge. Remember, the neuron was negatively charged at rest. The falling phase includes the parts of the action potential where the inside of the neuron goes back towards being negatively charged. This also includes the undershoot, whereby the inside of the neuron becomes temporarily more negative than the normal resting membrane potential. Throughout the action potential phases, the focus is on what is occurring with the sodium potassium ATPase pumps, potassium leak channels, voltage-gated sodium channels, and voltage-gated potassium channels. All of this revolves around where ions are moving, where are there more sodium versus potassium ions, and what is the charge inside the neuron like. We will now take a closer look at the rising and falling phases of an action potential, focusing on the ion channels that are open and closed, where ions are moving, where are ions more concentrated, and what is happening to the charge environments of the neuron. The rising phase of the action potential, corresponding with depolarization, begins immediately after the greater potential or series of greater potentials reach threshold. During this phase, the membrane potential becomes increasingly less negative in charge, surpasses zero millivolts, and then becomes increasingly positive up to a charge of about 40 millivolts. Throughout the rising phase, sodium potassium ATPase pumps and potassium leak channels continue to function as normal. That is, the ATPase pumps move three sodium ions out of the neuron in exchange for two potassium ions being moved into the neuron. Potassium leak channels allow potassium ions to leak out of the neuron only to be pumped back in in exchange for sodium ions. Despite both working to create and maintain a negatively charged memory potential, they absolutely cannot match the sheer magnitude of what happens during the rising phase. The cause of the rising phase and the significantly rapid change in memory potential becoming more positive is all through the opening of voltage-gated sodium channels. The opening of voltage-gated sodium channels as a result of threshold being reached increases the permeability to sodium ions by 1,000 times compared to rest. The result is that thousands of sodium ions rush into the neuron, going down the sodium electrochemical gradient. This rapidly makes the inside of the neuron more positive in charge because all these positively charged sodium ions move in where there are already thousands of positively charged potassium ions. As the sodium ions rush into the neuron, the membrane potential passes zero millivolts. After zero millivolts, it is considered the overshoot at, at this point because it is going well past what originally was being negative in charge, and it's going to start to approach positive 40 millivolts. At positive 40 millivolts, the voltage-gated sodium channels become inactivated and no longer let sodium ions into the neuron. This is the peak of the action potential. At this peak, as voltage-gated sodium channels have become inactivated, voltage-gated potassium channels are now completely open. They were in the process of opening during that rising phase, but they are slow to open. So once these voltage-gated potassium channels are completely open and the voltage-gated sodium channels are inactivated, this will trigger the beginning of the falling phase.
The falling phase of the action potential, corresponding with repolarization, involves the neuron going back towards a resting membrane potential. During this phase, the membrane potential becomes increasingly less positive in charge, descending down, passing zero millivolts, and then becoming increasingly negative, heading towards a charge of negative 90 millivolts. Throughout the falling phase, sodium-potassium ATPase pumps and potassium leak channels continue to function as normal. That is, sodium-potassium ATPase pumps are moving three sodiums out of the neuron in exchange for two potassium ions being moved into the neuron. Potassium leak channels are continuing to allow potassium ions to leak out of the neuron only to have them be pumped back in in exchange for sodium ions. So here, in the falling phase, not only are sodium ions being pumped out, but the voltage-gated serum channels are inactivated at this point. Therefore, sodium is leaving the neuron, but not entering the neuron. Not only this, but voltage-gated potassium channels are now completely open, thus allowing thousands of potassium ions to rush out of the neuron, following the potassium electrochemical gradient. Taken together, Sodium being pumped out of the neuron, combined with potassium ions rushing out through voltage-gated potassium channels, rapidly drives the inside of the neuron to become more negative in charge because all these positively charged ions are being moved out of the neuron. As these processes continue, the neuron quickly passes normal resting membrane potential of negative 65 millivolts and begins to approach negative 90, which is the maximum extracellular potassium concentration possible. Passing normal resting membrane potential is termed the undershoot, and this is caused by voltage-gated potassium channels remaining open a bit too long. Remember that voltage-gated potassium channels are slow to open, and therefore they're also slow to close. Once the voltage-gated potassium channels finally close, and potassium ions are no longer leaving the neuron, the sodium-potassium ATPase pumps and potassium leak channels start to take a larger control. They begin to move the neuron back to resting membrane potential. As usual, the sodium-potassium ATPase pumps use energy to move three sodium ions out of the neuron while moving two potassium ions into the neuron. As usual, potassium Leak channels allow potassium ions to leak out of the neuron, back into the extracellular environment, so the sodium-potassium ATPase pumps can pump the potassium back in and bring even more sodium outside. Eventually, through the combined efforts of sodium-potassium ATPase pumps and potassium leak channels, the neuron membrane potential is restored back to rest, that is, negative 65 millivolts. So let's finish quickly with the conduction or propagation of the action potential that we just described. The creation of the action potential that we just described begins at the axon hillock where the cell body meets the axon. Propagation of this initial action potential will continue down the axon towards the axon terminals, relying on positive feedback. Positive feedback in this case being that the rapid opening of voltage-gated sodium channels at one region causes rapid depolarization of that region, which will then cause the opening and depolarization of the next region, which will then cause the opening of voltage-gated sodium channels and depolarization of the next region, and so on and so on. Therefore, action potentials are traveling along an axon much like dominoes acting as a step-by-step -step depolarization and repolarization down the axon towards the axon terminals. This process is very important because electrical signals decay as they travel, so regenerating the action potential at each region along the axon ensures that the signal does not decay before reaching the end of the neuron. The end result of an action potential propagation is that the action potential will reach the axon terminals, where neurotransmitter vesicles are located, and the arrival of this action potential will trigger the subsequent release of neurotransmitters so that the electrical signals can be transmitted to the next neuron along the chain.